when you look at the streaming landscape out there, there are so many competitors, so many different options out there. How do you sort of stand out in a crowd that seems to just be getting more crowded by the day? Well, I think we have a unique proposition, Romaine. Mm -hmm. we, we program to the full menu of factual entertainment. Mm -hmm. So that's science, it's history, it's technology, it's cuisine, it's travel, it's lifestyle, it's society. So we're not a niche. We're mm -hmm. a big category, just like sports is a category, mm -hmm. just like news is a category. Yeah. And we have a global proposition. Factual content travels well, right? Mm -hmm. Planet is a planet is a planet. Alligator is an alligator. So we've got a great proposition that's being received well around the world. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Roku because Roku will be reporting mm -hmm. earnings this week. And Roku is a platform. Uh, they have hardware. And a lot of people weren't sure how they would fit into the streaming war, the streaming landscape, but they seem to have done very well. What did the skeptics get wrong? Well, they seem to be fitting in very well. So first, I think consumers like it because it's relatively easy to use. You know, they've built Roku into many of the TV sets today, so that makes it even easier. And you have, you know, 35 to 40 million active accounts, mm -hmm. okay? And those 35 to 40 million are going to stream probably 50 billion minutes, you know, over this next year of 100,000 TV shows and films. So you don't need geniuses in your ad sales department to monetize that. I mean, that's just massive. And so I think, I think people looked at it, you know, initially, and they kind of dismissed Anthony Wood as this sort of tech head, mm. you know, but he made yeah. it real simple. And uh, what an incredible story, incredible story. Yeah, incredible stories. The Disney story and how fast they've taken off is mm -hmm. pretty incredible. But is it sustainable? Is a lot of these promotional clients that have been brought on and how long do they stay for? Yes, yeah, Chanel, I think it's absolutely sustainable. I think 18 months ago, to talk to most analysts, they would have said, okay, Disney Plus needs to get to 50 million subscribers to break even. And it's probably going to take them three to four years to do that. Well, they got there in about a, halfway there in about a quarter. So I think, you know, by any objective standard of measurement, they're probably going to get there in a year. And by the way, with all of their inherent uh, marketing advantages and with this growing denominator of people who can stream TV, Reed, Reed Hastings says, you know, anybody that can stream a YouTube video is a potential customer. So that denominator is $2 billion. So yeah. I, think, I think Disney Plus is probably going to $200 million in the next handful of years. And by the way, I think Netflix is... With their escape velocity is going to 400 million, mm. and at Curiosity Stream, you know, we see a path to hundreds of millions of subscribers as well. So you mentioned YouTube. Why haven't we seen a little bit more or better monetization out of something like YouTube? I mean, a lot of people thought that was going to be sort of a gold mine because you were using user-generated content that presumably was free. Well, I think there's a difference between user-generated content and premium content, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, at Curiosity Stream, you know, we have premium factual programming that you really can't find on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's the case with, you know, compare Disney to YouTube, et cetera. There's a safe harbor element for certain brands. You know, I think that, that comes into play. But look, at the end of the day, you know, they're going to be a juggernaut. And then last week it was announced that they're even talking about putting channel packages together to complement the YouTube TV service, which is pretty awesome.